Hi everybody, this is Dr. Swanson. Let's talk about topic number four, which is strategic writing in sales and marketing. This topic builds very much off of topic three last, uh, last week because, again, we're straying a little bit further from strategically public relations into communication areas that are related to but not directly public relations oriented. But as, again, as I said last week, this is important because public relations writers need to be able to write across a variety of different media formats. And if, if strictly all you could do was write news releases and backgrounders, you really wouldn't be of much value to the employer in, in most situations because employers need you to be able to write a variety of different things and you have to be able to work on those tools all at the same time. Example, when I was in a public relations agency, and I, I was new in PR, as I've told you, I've, I had not worked in public relations before, got a job in a PR agency, and so I was doing a whole lot of things at the same time, just as we do in this class. I was writing uh, news releases on a, on a regular basis, let me see. Let me think of some of the things I was doing. We had a big campaign going on for a doctor's group, and they wanted a series of advertisements on medical specialties. So I had to go to the library and do extensive research on different kinds of medical specialties, and then I had to condense that information into copy for different advertisements. There was like gastroenterology and, and audiology and di all these different medical specialties. I had to do that. Uh, I was working on a series of advertisements for an electric cooperative. The, the cooperative wanted to sell more appliances, and so we had to create a whole series of, of advertisements with different radio characters selling, um, selling home appliances. Uh, so I was doing that. Um, what else was I doing? Um, yeah, I was doing a script. I was doing scripts because we were working for a candidate running for sheriff and I had to write a whole bunch of campaign scripts, and I'd never met the man when I started working on the projects. They gave me his bio and background information, and then they told me to write campaign campaign speeches, you know, script speeches of this guy that I had never met before. So, you know, and, and I was, I was a, a, a greenhorn in public relations. I was still wet behind the ears, and I was doing all these things at the same time. Uh, and we were shooting videos. We were shooting videos for a client, so I was going on scene to help help. Um, or help I was going on location to help shoot the videos, and 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 writing that stuff. So I mean, this and this was many years ago. So, today, if I were working in the agency, I'd be doing all that in addition to the social media posting. So this is the this is the real world. This is the real world of public relations writing. You have to be able to do all of these different things, and so. That's a good reason why, in this class, we're giving you all of these different options. Okay, so let's talk about strategic writing in sales and marketing. Now, I know many of you may have the same response to sales that I do. I've done sales before. I don't like it, but I can do it um, because I'm trained as a communicator. Um, and, and I've been involved in stuff that's strictly marketing, and it's not really my favorite thing to do, but I can do it. And the important thing is that you, at this point in this class, have, in the context of writing, have an understanding of how salespeople write and how marketing people write and how you could pick apart that writing and make sense of it. Okay, so we've talked already about the differences between journalism and public relations and advertising and public relations. Now we're kind of looking at the differences between sales and marketing and public relations. All similar, but all different. And it all involves storytelling. The bottom line here is in this class, you are flexing your mental muscles to become a storyteller in writing for these different formats and with these different tools with an understanding of the visuals that accompany that because writing more often than not has visuals along with it. Sometimes you're writing copy exclusively for the visuals as you would with a television script. So got to think about these things. That takes us to a thinking about audiences and publics. Throughout the readings in this class so far, we've talked about demographics and psychographics. 
demographics is how people are different from one another. So you guys, for the most part, are members of a demographic group. So you're all, uh, or most of you are in your 20s, you're college students. You probably fall generally within the same income range. Um, racially, there's a lot of disparity there, but in terms of other demographic factors, you guys are all pretty much the same. Um, so demographics is age, sex, income, occupational variables, the things that allow us to quantitatively look at a group and see how members of that group are similar. Psychographics is how you think. Psychographics is much more difficult to track. I could look at you guys demographically and see that you're probably all pretty much the same. Psychographically, you're going to be all over the map because everybody thinks differently and you can't put people into a box, psychographically speaking. Um, you may have this situation with yourself. I have two children, two adult children. They're in their 30s. They grew up in the same home, under the same parenting, same guidance, same everything. Psychographically, they're like this. Okay, I got one on this end of the spectrum over here, and I got another one on this end of the spectrum over here, and, and I look at these guys and I think, they came out of the same house? How do they think so differently? You may have a sibling where you think that same thing. I grew up with this person? How did this happen? That's psychographics. We all think differently based on our background, our upbringing, and all the variables that impact us in life. So psychographics is about values. It's about motivations. And everybody's experience is different, and that results in a different set of values and expectations. And so demographics is one thing to chart. It's fairly, fairly easy to do that. But psychographically, trying to figure out how what you wrote, how it's going to hit these people, and how it's going to motivate them, that is a complete science in itself. And in fact, there's an entire career field that a lot of PR people go into that is based on working with attorneys to look at potential jurors in a jury pool and figure out how those people are going to think and how they're likely to vote. That is a whole science in itself because if you're a defense attorney and you want your client to be found innocent, you want to get a jury that's going to be likely to vote in favor of your client and not convict your client. And so you want to have guidance there that will tell you which people from the jury pool you want on the jury and which ones you don't. And that's a whole science. And so if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, psychology is a great minor to have because public relations or com public relations as a major, psychology as a minor, you can really get into thinking about people and, and really working with people in that way. So Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the success of all of this because ultimately our writing isn't worth squat unless we can demonstrate that it is successful. And so some of the, uh, some of the assignments here at the end of the class will, will get us to that place, the campaign report critique that you're going to be working on um, in this topic area. That's something that gets us toward success because just having produced written copy is not in itself a strong measure of success. How do we evaluate it? How do we make sense of it? All of that is covered in the Learning Outcomes uh, Readings and Study Guide document, so I want you to take a look at that. But just for the purposes of this video, just keep in mind that we have got to be able to demonstrate the success of the work that we do. And historically in public relations, we've done a sucky job of doing that. Only about, uh, according to a, a study back in the early 2000s, only about 5% of public relations programs have been effectively measured, assessed, and evaluated. In other words, people get done with a PR campaign and they go, Whew, glad that's over, and they go on to the next thing. And, and no, 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 wait, 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 wait. We have to see how successful that was because if we don't know how successful it was, we haven't gained anything, we haven't learned anything, we haven't demonstrated to the client ROI. And you'll recall from earlier readings, ROI is return on investment. How does the client know that the money they put into this came back to them? Was it worth it? Unless you do some kind of measurement, evaluation, you know, some kind of research to determine whether or not this was successful, you can't answer the ROI question. And that's going to be a problem because 
Here's a little hint for your first client interaction. Clients will always question why you did something. They'll always question why you did something. And if, if they don't think that what you did was a good idea, they're not going to pay for it. Um, or they're, they're at least going to squabble about it. You don't want to do that. You want to have all kinds of evidence to show why you did this and why the client should pay for it. Personally, you've got to constantly be evaluating your own work as a professional. You want to get a raise? You've got to be able to document to your supervisor that you are worth the money that they spent on you because ROI involves employees too. So you've got to constantly look for all the ways you can to document that your work was valuable. And that doesn't mean that you, you know, put it up in your employer's face and say, look, 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 look. It means that you just have it in the drawer in case you're ever asked for it. You can say, well, as a matter of fact, I am worth the money that you're paying for me. Look, I did this, 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 this. So that's really important stuff. So um, we've got to constantly be doing a better job of documenting what we're worth as PR people. Because if we don't, the client is going to question you on stuff, the employer is going to question you on stuff, and publicly, people are going to look at us askance. They're going to look at us askance. They're going to go, PR people, what are they worth? You know, it's, you know, fake news, only it'll be fake PR. You know, people for years have called us in the public relations profession, spin doctors and flax. And they call us that because they don't see the value of what we're doing. They think that we're just spinning the truth. So it is our obligation to do a better job of evaluating the worth of what we've done so that we are not called spin doctors and flax. So the, the um, learning outcomes document has a variety of information uh, in there about how we document that what we have done is valuable. And that, you know, that gets back to the whole sales and marketing thing because sales and marketing are very bottom line oriented. And in order for you to impress an employer with what you've done in a bottom line context, you've got to be able to document your bottom line, that you were um, valuable to the employer as a resource. So those are my tips for now. And I thank you very much. And if you have any questions, let me know. Onward.